Okie dokie. How are we doing? <laughs> doing alright? Yeah. Any questions about anything before we get going? Alright, so I want to do a couple more uh, just examples. Make sure that we're all on the same page with getting this stuff to go in Excel. Um, make sure we understand the interpretations and so forth before we get into uh, stuff on regression. So we did not do seven. Oh, we did we did three and five last time, yes, but not seven. Okay. I've slept since then, so I don't really remember what happened. <laughs> uh, data. I hit the wrong thing. I don't want to draw. All right, so remember to do our two-factor ANOVA, we use the data analysis package that we can load into Excel. In the 7.6-7, the setup is whether or not four brands of gasoline give the same performance in terms of miles per gallon as uh, in three different types of cars. So down the vertical column, we've got the three different kinds of cars across the horizontal row there at the top. We've got the four different types of gas. We've got multiple samples in each of the cells here. Remember, when we have the multiple samples in each of the cells, what we're really trying to test for is whether or not there's interaction among the cells. Right? So take those larger uh, sample sizes in there. So remember that in these problems, when you have interaction in each cell, we can have a row effect. Does it matter? Does the row that we're in matter? So is car one different than car two different than car three? That's the row effect, right? We also have column effect. In this, in this uh, scenario, is gas 1 different than gas 2, different than gas 3, different than gas 4? So that would be the column effect in that case. But also when we're talking about interaction, does it matter is car 1 and gas 3 different than, is there an interaction variable there versus say car 3 and gas 3? Or car 3 and gas 1? So, for example, you've probably heard that certain cars require premium gas, especially in sports cars and those kinds of things. You want premium gas, otherwise there's uh, issues with the engine performance, those kinds of things. So, is there an interaction piece too? Now, the interaction piece is very self-dependent. So, when we have that additive model for the interaction piece, we mentioned this last time, but just to write it down again, we're thinking about the additive model for the mean in each cell, but it should be dependent on the overall mean, right? So the mu is the overall mean for all of the cells. The additive model says that the, in, the individual cell mean is based on the overall mean, the row effect, the column effect, and then this now interaction effect uh, is dependent upon the individual cell. That's a gamma, it's a one kilo gamma. I don't think I actually wrote this down last time. I mentioned it, we did it right at the end of the class, but I don't think I actually wrote it down. Okay. So, again, the idea here is that we're trying to test whether or not there is an interaction in between the different cells. So, of course, we want to do our hypothesis testing. The null hypothesis, there's going to be three different nulls, so we're going to do three different uh, hypothesis tests, but with the ANOVA that we do on Excel, we do all three at once. Okay. 
We of course want the fact that there is no row effect at all. We can set it up so that the sum of the row effects and the sum of the column effects and the sum of the interactions <laughs> all turn out to be zero. But we want it, we want the individual row effects, the individual column effects, the inter individual interactions, as far as the null hypothesis goes, to be zero for all of them, right? So we've got the null, like we wrote down last time for the null hypothesis, you've got a null hypothesis associated with the row interactions. Now we're saying that there is no row effect in any row. Obviously, if, there's a, if there is a non-zero row effect in one row, there has to be at least one other row that has a non-zero row effect too. Because remember, we have them all balanced out where they sum to zero. But overall, they have to balance. We went through that example last time. I was talking about what the row effect had to be in each row. We did that specific example. Okay. We've, so we've got a null hypothesis for the row effect. We've got a null hypothesis for the column effect. So all of those need to be zero. Same idea, if there's at least one column that has a row effect, excuse me, try that again. If there's at least one column that has a non-zero effect, if there's a column that has a row effect, that made no sense. If there's a column that has a non-zero effect, then there has to be another column to balance it out. At least one other column so that balances it out. All right. And then for the interaction part, we have to have a null, a null hypothesis that talks about, oh, for heaven's sake, right at gamma. The null hypothesis would be that there is no effect on the gammas as well. Okay. So let's just run the ANOVA and look at the different pieces that come out. So remember when we're testing for interactions, we're going to do ANOVA with replication. Well, the ANOVA without replication is when we are to have a good bet that we don't have any interactions in our cells. Those were when we only had the one observation per cell anyway. Okay, so here we've got multiple observation per cell, multiple observations per cell. So we're assuming that we've got some sort of interaction in there. All right, so our input range, remember again with your input range for the with replication, we want to make sure we grab the headers. With, when we did without replication, we didn't want the headers. We just wanted the data. Okay. Uh, rows per sample. We've got four rows in each one, right? If I'm counting correctly. So I'll type in the four there. Yeah, you can change the significance level if you'd like. The significance level, of course, is what's going to give us our critical F values. So as you change that, it'll change your F values. The P value will stay the same no matter what because the p-value is based on the data. Um, you can always put it in a new worksheet if you want. I'm just going to put it in this worksheet. So put it over here. doesn't matter where. And then we get a whole bunch of summary stuff that comes out. So let me scroll up here. The first part, of course, is just giving you the summaries for uh, CAR1, or, sorry, yeah, car one with each of the gases, car two with each of the gases, and so on down the line. Okay. So the very last part is where our ANOVA comes in. So the first row in the ANOVA here is our row effect row, if you will. Okay. This is our column effect row. And this is our interaction row. So then the last part 
is our SSE, our sum of squared error, or error sum of squares, whichever way you want to say it. Okay. So this, remember this is our variable that does not change distribution no matter what the alpha, the beta, and the gammas are. Right? As long as the model is linear, or excuse me, as long as the model is additive, linear means it has a different connotation. As long as the model is additive here, that we can model the individual cell means by overall mean and then add a row effect, add a column effect, add an interaction effect. As long as this model is valid, then the SSE has the exact same distribution every single time. Okay. So the SSE was the within? Is the within, yeah. Okay. And again, each of these, we made the argument that each of these has a chi-squared distribution. And then if we want to measure if there is interaction or not, or sorry, if there is a row effect, if there is a column effect, if there is that interaction, we're going to measure the relative size of the, the uh, statistic associated with each of those versus the interaction variable. Okay? So we're going to do that ratio of chi-squares divided out by their degrees of freedom. When we do chi-square over chi-square is what gives us an F. Right? Okay. So uh, the means, this is your mean squared error or the mean square of whatever. So remember that's just your sum of squares divided by your numbers degree, number of degrees of freedom. Just another statistic that's reported for you, but it's not a hard one to calculate, right? If you've got your sum of squares here, you just divide by your degrees of freedom. You can check those. Then you can see, before we even compute the Fs, you can see that the relative sizes against SSE are pretty small, right? And if you actually do the ratios, which is what they're doing here, you get Fs that are pretty small. If you're getting small f's, you better have large degrees of freedom, okay, to be able to be able and do anything that's rejecting. And you can see that here. We don't have. I mean, this one's got a big degree of freedom, but we're not doing the f based on that one, right? So it's based on these other ones. And these are small degrees of freedom, so you don't get really, really small critical values, okay? Now they're kind of close, but they're not that close. Looking at your p-values, your p-values are all bigger than 0.05. So in all three cases, you would not reject the null hypothesis. So you don't have enough evidence to say that there is a row effect. You don't have enough evidence to say that there is a column effect. You don't have enough evidence to say that there is any interaction. Which is a good thing, especially if you're trying to test gas versus car model. Right? I mean... Perhaps you would want a row effect in that case if you're saying my gas is better than other somebody else's gas because I put an additive in it or I make my gas cleaner or there's less ethanol or something along those lines. You can think about if you've paid attention to anything with gasoline before, you know that there's different octane levels, there's different amounts of ethanol that are put in different blends of gasoline. Uh, some cars will run on a higher blend of ethanol than other cars will, right? So maybe you wanted to see a column effect here. I mean, it depends on what you're testing. Okay. But in this case, there's not enough evidence to say that there was any type of a column effect. On the, other, on the flip side of that, since there wasn't a row effect either, or at least there's not evidence for a row effect, it's saying that, hey, look, our gas works the same no matter what car you pick. Right? So in that instance, the fact that there was not a row effect was a good thing. Or at least not evidence of a row effect would be a good thing, right? Our gas is performing similarly in different models of cars. So that would be okay. So it all depends on context, whatever you're doing. Now, I don't know how many people in here are going to be doing statistical tests on gasoline when they graduate, but you never know. Okay. But again, the idea here is context. Also, the interaction being... Um, not present is also, I think, a relatively good thing that 
Well, I've got this kind of gasoline, but I, don't, I want to make sure I don't put it in this kind of car because it makes the performance go down. It might be better for some cars, but not others. Now that does happen with, like I said, those higher performance vehicles. You would not want to have low quality gas in your Maserati right? if you were driving down the street, for example. I don't know why you drive a Maserati down the street, period, but because I would not want to take a chance of that thing getting damaged, personally. <laughs> not around here. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, yeah, I, well, I actually saw a Maserati in town one day. I was I was flabbergasted. First, when I worked in West Virginia, I saw a Rolls Royce there once, so I don't know why. Why there's a Rolls Royce in West Virginia of all places? Really? That's bizarre. <laughs> I would. I don't think I, if I ever. Well, a, I don't have enough money to own those kind of cars. But if I did, I don't think I want to drive it on the road. Period. Especially cars that are meant to go fast. I think I want to have down on a track and do that. I don't worry about that too much. This one okay? All right. So let's do. And again, like I said, I want you to understand where this stuff comes from, but I'm not going to make you reproduce any of the setup that we did last time. I'm certainly not going to make you do these computations by hand. That's why we have different computer programs to do these things. It's supposed to save the time. So the interpretation here is more important, more relevant than the other stuff. But it's still, it is important to understand that, and to understand the things of, why these degrees of freedom are what they are. Well, again, we've got three rows and we lose a degree of freedom for each row, right? We've got four columns, we lose a degree of freedom for each column. The ones for the SSEs are the ones that are left over, right? So understanding where those different uh, degrees of freedom come from and why it's an F statistic, why each of these are chi-squared random variables, because really we are looking at squares of things. That's why it's called chi squared. So, so yeah. um, we can answer all three of those with this one? Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's the, the sample is your row. And it's it, possible to like reject one but not reject mm -hmm. another. Yep. yep. It's absolutely possible to do that. Yep. Like I said, in this one, you might have wanted to reject this one. You might have wanted to see a, a column effect saying that it gas one was better, got a higher performance in each of the cars. So you might want to see a column effect and not see a row effect because I want to make sure that I get a better performance in all of the cars, not just a better performance in some of the cars. And actually, that part would probably, uh, if there was a better performance in some of the cars and a worse performance in others, then you would probably see an interaction at that point. So, yeah, it's definitely possible to redirect one and not the others in any combination of those things. And it better be because all those variables are supposed to be independent of each other. Yeah, so we should be able to get any combination of them. So let's look at another one. Let's look at 10. I might as well do all of these since I typed up all the data, so why not? All right. So um, again, we can run all of these at once. This was the setup here is uh, do need to do. We're doing. I lost where it was. Locals, uh, well, it didn't say anything. It just says, oh, I'm looking at the wrong, that's why. It said the context was in a different problem, and I was looking at the different problem, and it didn't make any sense. It's because it's in a different section. The context of the problem was that you've got cl uh, cholesterol levels in women and men uh, that were under 40 and over 40. So... In the previous section, when we were doing the one factor, it was just looking at samples of had women over 50, women under 50, men over 50, women, men under 50. 
and had them broken up into four categories and then did cholesterol levels. Versus here, they did, a, they did individual cells in that case that did only ANOVA to see if the means were different, right? In this case, we've broken it up into a similar idea, but doing the two-factor ANOVA with, we've broken it up into females and males, broken up into under 50, over 50, and then looking at having samples in each of those cells. Okay. So the difference between the two, it's, it, we're coming, hopefully coming up with similar results, obviously. But the idea behind this was before they did this as one mean that they were looking at. They did this as one mean they were looking at. This one is one and this is one. So we had four different means. And the one factor ANOVA tests, is there a difference of, is there any, is one of the means different than the other? Is one of these things not like the other ones? All right. In this case, we're going to do a similar thing. We're going to test, is there a difference between males and females by a row effect? We're going to test, are under 50, over 50 different by a, a column effect? And then interaction is being female and over 50 different than being male and under 50 or male and over 50, those kinds of things. And okay, that's where the interaction effect comes in. Okay. So instead of just the means being different, we're just phrasing it in a different context. So let's do this. And we can also see if we get similar results by going back to the one factor ANOVA as well. So two factor with replication. Uh, let's select our sample. Again, remember with this, you want to make sure you grab the headers too. Rows per sample, there are seven. Is that right? Seven? If I counted correctly. And then output range, put it down there. All right, so here's the ANOVA at the bottom. The other rest are just the summaries of the different ideas. But there's the ANOVA at the bottom. Notice not lots of degrees of freedom here because we only have two rows and two columns, so the degrees of freedom are small. But over here, look, you've got two low p-values. That's good, right? We want low p-values, that helps you reject. So what do these two say? Well, there is a difference between, uh, this is your row effect. So being male versus being female, there is a difference in cholesterol level. That's what that first one would say. So that's the evidence would suggest that there is a difference in cholesterol level, <coughs> versus men versus women. Okay. What's the second one say for columns? There's a difference between the ages. Yeah, there's a difference between the ages, right? Being under 50 and being over 50, there's a difference in the cholesterol levels. What's the last one say? Well, this one, this one p-value is high, so it would not reject. So is there any evidence of interaction? No. So being in a particular cell, being female and under 50, or being male and over 50, or any of those kinds of things, those kind of interactions aren't having the effect that just being male or female or just being over 50 or under 50 is having. Does that make sense? Uh, again, it said that, uh, that's why I was having issues with the context. It said that it just did this as a different problem where it separated them into four here. So let's see if we can do that. Let's just do this real quickly. All right. So all I've done here is separate them into females under 50, females over 50, males under, <coughs> males over, as four different things that we want to test the means. So we did this before with the, 
one factor ANOVA, right? A, a single factor ANOVA, one way ANOVA. So our input range here will just be what I can't see. All right, grouped by, I think I grouped them by rows, didn't I? I put them across. I guess I got to just call it people over as columns, but that's okay. Change them to output range to here. There we go. All right, so here were your row means again. We got, again, we rejected. Right? Now, notice that here the rejection would just say that one, at least one of the means is different than the others. So again, being female under 50, being female over 50, being male over 50, being male over 50, at least one of them is different than the other three. That's all we can conclude from the, the one-factor ANOVA, right? It's the same, it's a similar conclusion that we made over here. It's just the second one we did the two-way, the two-factor ANOVA, we were able to make a stronger statement, right? We saw that there is a row effect, so there is actually a difference from male to female. There is a column effect, so there is a difference from being under 50 and being over 50. So being able to split it into four groups in this fashion and doing a two-factor ANOVA allowed us to make a stronger conclusion than we would have otherwise. That makes sense. You okay with that? Let's do, like I said, let's do the last one since I, you know, I typed it in. Might as well do it. All right. So, do our two factor without replica uh, with with replication. Sorry. We've got this is our region. We got what four rows? No, three rows per sample. And change our output spot. All right, so there's our ANOVA again. The setup on this one was um, uh, different levels of smoking and different um, oxygen uptakes in each of the different exercises were measured. So what would your conclusions be in this one? Reject the row in the column. Yeah, reject the row in the column interaction? No. As a matter of fact, it looks like there's literally no interaction, right? That p-value is huge. <sighs> right? 0.92 is a really, really big p-value. There's no, there's definitely no uh, no evidence for interaction there, right? So, in context, then, there is a row effect. Well, that makes sense. If you're talking about uh, maximum oxygen uptake in minutes, well, I think it matters if you're a smoker or not. <laughs> Right, and then depending on the type of test that you're doing, well, riding a bicycle is probably a little bit an easier activity than running on a treadmill, which is probably a little bit easier than going on a stepper, depending on the speeds at which you're doing things. But right, so it would make sense that it would take longer or take shorter amounts of time to get to maximum intake, depending on what you're doing. So yeah, and those the, the conclusions seem to make sense, right? That oxygen intake is exercise dependent, oxygen intake is uh, smoking dependent, but there's probably not a lot of interaction between those things. Does that make sense? All right. So. Any other questions about analysis of variance before we switch over to regression thoughts? Okay. So uh, 
<clears throat> let's talk about then. We're going to jump back to chapter 6. Only because we need to do a little bit of preliminaries. Because we're also going to be doing some hypothesis testing on linear regression models. So you've probably talked about, well, if you've had regression analysis before, you've talked about regression models, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how the model is developed. But one of the things that you're interested in for linear regression or least squares line, you're talking about putting a, a line to go through some data and try to model some data. Well, one of the things that you might want to know is with the line, you've got a y-intercept and you've got a slope. Do you really anticipate those being something different from zero? That's the kind of hypothesis testing that we're going to do on this, whether or not we have confidence that there is actually some slope or actually a y-intercept. Okay. So, but again, to get to that point, we've got to uh, put some context down and see where the model comes from before we can actually start talking about doing things like confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Now again, with computing confidence intervals and computing hypothesis testing on these things, we're going to let Excel do the work. Okay, We're not going to compute these things by hand. But I do want you to know where they come from again so that you understand what the distributions are and what the values are, what the numbers are giving you. Okay. So, to that end, <clears throat> pardon me, let's say we have a set of points, say an x1, y1, an x2, y2, an xn, yn. What we want is we want to, or hopefully we can model the expected value of y as some sort of linear model. So we're going to assume, we're going to start with that our expected value of the y, so the y1, y2, out to yn, we're going to assume the mean of the y's, the expected value of the y's is a linear function of x, whatever the x value is. Okay. So what we mean by that is that it, for any particular y that we have, wherever it happens to be, it depends on what the x is, but it goes in a linear fashion. So if, say it was, uh, if you knew that the expected value of y for x equal to 1 was 6, and the expected value of y when x is 2 was 8, it went up by 2 when x went up by 1, you would expect that the expected value of y when x is equal to 3 would be 10. So it would go up another 2. That's what we mean by being a linear function, right? Okay. So what we're going to assume then is that we want to try to figure... Uh, we were to assume that, of course, there's going to be some error that pops up when we try to do this model. So for each of these y sub i's, whatever it happens to be, there's going to be some constant, whatever that happens to be. But again, if it's linear in x, that constant, whatever it is, is the same constant no matter what. right? If it's linear in x, you have a y-intercept, right? Now, y-intercept doesn't change when the x value changes, right? But what will change, and also the slope doesn't change as the x changes, but the error might. So there's some error term here on the end. Okay. So again, just to emphasize what's going on, the y sub i is just wherever we are along the y-axis, okay? So we can think about it being the distribution of this y1 came from capital Y1, the little y2 came from a distribution of capital Y2, and so on down the line, okay? Whatever this distribution is, again, it's the expected value is linear in the x. Now notice I'm using little x's here, right? Okay. 
When I use these little x's, whatever I get out for a little y might actually be different than what the expected value is. Okay? So there's going to be some error associated with using that as an approximation. Okay. So we've got this linear model here. Again, the y-intercept doesn't change, the slope doesn't change, the x-value, of course, does, the, and the error could change. Of course, the error is dependent upon what you pick for the x, right? Okay, so there's going to be a little error term there. Now, of course, if we do expected values, and think about doing this over and over and over and over again, what would you expect the expected value for the error to be? If this is a true model, if it's a true linear model, what would you expect the expected value of the error to be? If you do it over and over and over and over again. If y was truly a linear function of x, what would you expect that error's mean to be? Well, even better, what would you expect it to be? If I, if I knew that y was in fact a linear function of x, what would you expect the error to be on the on average? What would you expect the error to be? Yeah. It better be zero, right? If y is truly a function of x, we would expect that the average value of your error should be zero overall, right? So it should be it should have a mean of zero. Well, if you've got nice functions or excuse me, nice um, nice variables that we're dealing with. What kind of distribution do you expect the uh, errors to have? Do you expect the errors to get, I mean, do you expect very, very bad errors to occur, be likely to occur? Put it that way first. Would you expect the, would you expect on, a, well, not on average, would you expect the errors typically to be closer to zero or far away from zero? Assuming that you really do have a linear model. If you calculate these errors, do you think errors would be common? Big errors would be common or big errors would be rare? Be rare, right? So what kind of distribution do you think the errors that we're going to assume they have? Do we expect them to be smaller errors or more likely than bigger errors? What kind of distribution do you think we'll assume the error to have? They'd be bunched up in the middle and smaller on the tails. What kind of distribution is that? Normal. normal. There you go. Yeah. We're going to assume that our errors are going to be normal here, which we assume everything is normal, essentially, right? But we're going to assume that the errors are normal. Good. All right. So we're going to assume that our error, the distribution of our error, no matter what it is, is normal on zero. With a, but with a common variance to start with, or sigma squared. So we're assuming that we always have a normal distribution for our errors, no matter what they are. They all have mean zero, which makes sense, right? If we really do have a true linear model here, I would expect that the errors should be mean to uh, average around zero. And then we'll have this common variance for our errors, so that the variance does not depend on the x. The variance is the same no matter where we are. Okay? All right. To set things up to get some formulas here, however, to see what the, the distributions have to look like, let's make a little bit of an assumption here. I'd like this thing to, kind of like a point slope form idea, I'd really like this thing, this part here, to be centered at its mean of the x's. Okay? So let's just rewrite this for the time being as y sub i is equal to an alpha plus beta times x sub i minus x bar plus the epsilon sub i. So our alpha here is going to be, um, it's alpha 1 plus beta x bar. Let's put that off to the side. All right. So, now like I said here, we're, gonna, we're assuming that 
everything here is normal. So each of these things is normal, right? Well, if I know that my y sub i's are normal and my epsilon, well, if I know the x's are normal and the y sub are normal and the epsilons are normal, if everything here is normal, I can find uh, the PDF without too much difficulty, right? In particular, I could find the uh, let's see what I'm saying here. We got lost in my in the book a little bit. All right, so this is a model that we're dealing with here. I want to try to well, I know in particular that this is normal, but uh, in particular, I also know that this thing is normal here. I'm trying to figure out how to minimize, if you will, distances. This is how we get the least squares idea. So remember we did our likelihood function. Uh, let's first talk about what the PDF of this thing is. So remember for your PDF for your normal, what did we have? It was what? 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared. I'm just, I'm just trying to remember what the PDF is for the normal. 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared and then e to the what it was x minus mu and negative x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared right that was our pdf for normal do you agree with that okay so, going back up here again, this independent variable here is normal. Well, and we're assuming that each of them are independent. They dip, depend on the x, but we're assuming that each of these is normal. Okay? We know, we have said we assumed that the, the uh, error part here has a mean of zero, right? Right? So the mean of each of these y sub i's is going to be just this part, right? Right? And I know that my sigma is not changing. So if I write this in terms of the y's, so the likelihood function for the sample y1, y2, out to yn is, well, the likelihood functions in terms of alpha, beta, and sigma squared, right? We have all three of those parameters because the y is in terms of alpha and beta. Uh, the expected value of y is in terms of alpha and beta. No epsilon because the expected value of epsilon is zero. It's in terms of alpha, beta, and sigma squared here. So uh, we would have, well, we would have the product, i equals 1 to n, of 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared, e to the mess here, negative yi minus alpha minus beta times xi minus x bar, that whole thing squared over 2 sigma squared. Okay. All right. Uh, just to emphasize where all this stuff is coming from, because it's messy, and I wasn't doing a very good job explaining here at the start. All right. Y sub i is a variable. This thing is far, I know that we're, we have x's to start with, but these x's are fixed, okay? So as far as this y sub i is concerned, this is a constant plus some error term, okay? When we do the, expect, but, but the, that's another reason why this is normal. If this is a constant and we're assuming the errors are normally distributed, the y's have to be normally distributed, okay? And when we do expected value, the expected value of this is zero. The only thing that's left is the constant. 
And again, if this is constant, there's no variable. There's no variance, I mean. Right? The only variance comes from this. So if this has a variance of sigma squared, this has a variance of sigma squared. The only variance in the y's is coming from the error, not from the x's. Okay? All right, so when we make this likelihood function, these y's are in terms of the alpha, the beta, and the sigma squared as far as the PDF goes. This would be your PDF because I'm just doing variable minus mean. That part's the mean, the expected value. Okay, so I'm literally just taking this normal PDF here and replacing the pieces. And then we're doing likelihood function. So we do the product over the sample. Remember doing the likelihood functions for maximum likelihood estimators? Right? Okay. All right. So we want to try to maximize this function. Let's assume, to start with, we're going to assume we have a constant variance. So we're going to be interested in maximizing this thing with respect to the alpha and the beta. Okay, because that's what we're trying to find is the slope and the y-intercept, right? Okay, so if we want to maximize this thing, let's first, remember we did this before, we took the log, right? We, we take the log of things, yeah? So when we take the log of the likelihood function, the log turns the, pro the, log turns the product into what? A sum. And this is also a product, right? Inside the product is a product. So it'll also change that into a sum, right? We agree with that? This part is a quotient. But the log of 1 will be 0. I can bring this exponent down in front. So you'll have what? You'll have a, one, a negative 1 half log of 2 pi sigma squared in that piece. It's because I've got a log of a quotient is the difference of the logs, and log of 1 is 0. And then I can bring the 1 half power down in front. We agree with that? Okay. The next part, uh, log and the exponential will cancel each other out, won't they? Right? So we'll end up with negative that mess. Times it. You mean times? Like it's the first natural, first natural log times this, this part times that? No, it's not times. It'll be minus. Negative. Because it's, a, it's we're doing log of that product, so we're splitting it up into a plus to start with. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. So it'll be minus y sub i minus alpha minus beta x sub i minus x bar. Um. Yeah. Still squared because I, I the log killed the exponential before it got to the square over 2 sigma squared. Okay. This first piece has no i's. Right? There's no i's in that. So when I add all of those together, I'll just get n times it, won't I? So that's negative n over 2 log of 2 pi sigma squared minus uh, this piece over here. There's no i's in the 2 sigma squared, so I can factor it out in front. However, the other pieces do have i's in them, right? So this will be sum i equals 1 to n of y i minus alpha minus beta x i minus x bar. And then the whole thing is, oops, I forgot my bracket on that last one, squared. Okay, so let's look at this thing. And the last thing I'm going to do is talk about this thing, and then we'll start work on it some more on Friday. Let's look at this thing. I want to maximize this function, right? And I'm trying to find the maximum likelihood estimators for alpha and for beta, right? Which is why we use what we use for our least squares line. 
you've probably already talked, if you've had regression analysis before, you've talked about formulas for the alpha and the beta. Okay. Maybe you didn't go through all of this mess, but you probably didn't talk about maximum likelihood estimators, but you figured out formulas. That's where we're headed, right? So the formulas we're going to use are the maximum likelihood estimators for the alpha and for the beta. Okay? Well, this part right here has absolutely no effect on the maximum likelihood estimator because it's just a constant. In fact, when I differentiate that with respect to alpha or beta, that piece is going to go away, right? So I don't need to worry about this part. It's this part that we have to worry about figuring a maximum of, right? However, this is positive because I'm squaring it, right? And we're subtracting, right? So to maximize this, I need to make this as small as possible because I'm subtracting, right? Right? So to maximize this thing, I need to make this as small as possible, or I need to make that sum of squares the least it can be. That's where the least squares comes from. That's why it's called least squares. I need to make that sum as small as I possibly can to maximize the likelihood. That's why it's called least squares. Okay? All right? So we'll talk about finding that actual critical value and then figure it, talk about how we get those, talk about the distributions, and then we'll let Excel play with the numbers. Okay? All right. Have a good one. We will see you next time. Are we going to be using Excel on like the test? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't use it in class and then expect right. you not to use it. Figure it out yourself. Yeah, that'd be kind of mean.